Hello and welcome to The Real Home Show, helping to make your dream home a reality however much you have to spend. Coming up, planning a two-storey wraparound extension, three ways to make the most of any garden space, tips for decorating with bright white, the lowdown on smart locks, what to do if your tradesperson's quote is higher than you expected, we take a look inside a kitchen extension that's perfect for entertaining, plus we're giving away an industrial dining table worth £1,250. First up this week, our small space squad has got advice on adding a wraparound two-storey extension. Join me afterwards for three foolproof ways to make any garden feel bigger. So here we are outside the lovely 1930 semi-detached home of Sarah and her family. They've got a fantastic place here in South Birmingham and they want to expand it and make it better for a growing family. So shall we have a look inside and see what we can do? Let's meet them. So Sarah, you've been in the house almost five years now. Tell me about some of the work that you've done. We've basically done everything. We've moved bathrooms, we've moved walls, put walls in, um, windows, rewired, replastered everywhere. Um, we've got two small children, so we're inevitably finding that we're running out of space. So we'd just like to understand how we can extend the downstairs and upstairs, just so that we've got a bit more space um, moving forwards. So tell me a little bit more about what the problems are. Is it downstairs living space? Is it bedrooms? What do you need? It's a bit of both. So we'd love to go out the back and have a big kitchen, dining, living space, um, more room for at Christmas, um, and then also go upstairs. So the um, third bedroom we'd like to make bigger, possibly with an ensuite. So you've spent a lot of money already, and we're going to try and spend some more. So how much do you want to spend? Um, I think we're looking sort of the 80 to 100k mark. Um, right, well that's music to my ears because that's quite a lot of money for a you know, significant change to this project. So why don't we step outside and have a look? So Sarah, here we are in your garden. It's absolutely beautiful out here. You're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in terms of creating the downstairs space you're after, it's quite an easy win really. You could easily extend single storey all the way across the back of the house, come out as far as United Neighbours Conservatory, pop some roof lights on and you're going to have a lovely open plan kitchen living diner. But then that leaves the problem of the bedroom upstairs. So have you thought about a loft conversion perhaps? We have, and I'm not that keen, I'll be honest. Um, I don't think we'd get the head tight enough to be able to have a kind of good usable space, so it's not one for us, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think you'll also probably obviously sacrifice that smaller third bedroom anyway to get access to the loft, so you're not really gaining an awful lot anyway, you'll get a better bedroom out of it, but not a lot more. I think actually the big win really is in actually building off Laura's idea of the single storey rear extension and adding a two storey extension just on that corner of the house, so a bit of a wraparound two storey extension, because that expands out that third bedroom, not only to be a bigger double bedroom, but you'll also get an ensuite in there as well, so I suspect you may well want to save that bedroom for yourself, yes. <laughs> especially with two kids, right? You know, so I think that's kind of the way to do it, and I think from a design perspective you can have all types of different sort of two-story extensions I think so you could actually go quite funky here um, it's a 1930s semi-detached home so you know you've got a bit of lib you know, a bit of freedom to add something a bit more special um, in terms of the budget you know I think you know we talked about 80 to 100 earlier I think it's going to swallow up all of that I'm afraid but I think it's definitely worth doing because this is a home as you said for the next 10 20 years of your life the critical bits of any, any yeah. anybody's life really in terms of kids at least and I think that's going to make it just a huge difference really so worth investing in so sort of building side of it solved I think we need to look at the layout inside and how we're going to deal with that which is Laura's domain so why don't we have a look inside let's go okay. so Sarah you've done a really lovely job of this kitchen diner and once we've moved out you can have loads more space to be creative with so what do you want from your dream kitchen um, I'd love to have a big range cooker even though I don't do the cooking but to have an island possibly um, and again as much natural lighting as possible um, to make it as airy as possible um, living space as well if we can if we can try and get a, um, a settee in it that would be fab um, it's just what the next steps are really <laughs> Good news is that you can get all of those things in here. So if you imagine the wall behind you is gone and you're three metres further back with a lovely bank of either bifold or sliding doors and then a roof lantern in the single storey extension bit, pop your dining table underneath there and that's going to be absolutely lovely for things like Christmas, birthday parties. That means this whole side of the room can be a living area. So use an L-shaped sofa to kind of define the space and give you a bit of a corridor into your utility. You might be able to squeeze in a downstairs toilet if you, if you push the budget a little bit there. And then this section 
section of the room is going to become your kitchen. So you can imagine having banks of units along both of those walls, um, your range cooker in the middle there, and then a, a nice island that can also double up as a breakfast bar. So you can imagine the kids sitting there while you're, or your husband's yeah. cooking. <laughs> so does that sound like the kind of space you'd imagine? Absolutely, that would be perfect. So it's just knowing what the steps, next steps are really in terms of getting moving. The first port of call would be find a really good builder. You're going to want to get two or three quotes from different people, see which ones you feel like you can work with going forward. Um, the best place to find one, if you don't know one, head to a website like checkertrade.com or ask friends and family for recommendations because those are always the best place to, to start. The good news is once you've found them, they're going to be able to help you with everything from the plans to calling in people you're going to need like structural engineers and they'll be able to help you with planning permission as well. Fab. Can't wait to get started. <laughs> If you need to call in the small space squad, then head to realhomes.com forward slash TV and fill in the short form. Who knows, we could be coming to your rescue in the next episode. Now, if your garden is uninspiring, overgrown, somewhere you never go, or all of the above, then I'm here to help. Stick around and I'll have the lowdown on smart locks. Do you ever look out the window at your garden and feel a sense of despair? Yep, me too. Whether you're stuck with a small square, an uninspiring rectangle, or just an overgrown patch of grass you never use, I'm here to help. I've got three fail-safe ways to transform even the most boring garden into somewhere that you'll actually enjoy spending time. First up, cover those fences. Obviously you need to check they're structurally sound and then paint them in a bold colour like a dark grey, dark blue or a sage green which will create a beautiful backdrop for plants. Then you need to choose plants that will grow quickly and help cover those unsightly panels. Not only will this make your garden look more attractive, you'll also create a real haven for wildlife. Now bamboo is a great option for year-round screening, as are climbing plants such as honeysuckle or wisteria which are hardy and grow in most conditions. Now obviously the varieties of plant you choose will depend on everything from your soil type to the amount of sun your garden gets. My tip here is go to your local garden centre and ask them for help in choosing. Secondly, think about zoning the space you have. Even the smallest of squares can be divided up into zones for relaxing, dining al fresco and enjoying your plants. Rather than thinking about squares or rectangles, why not consider curves and circles to create visual interest and make the most of the space available? For instance, you could have a semicircular shaped patio closest to your house for enjoying barbecues and then another semicircle in the furthest corner with some seating that you've made from reclaimed pallets where you can sit down and relax. Make sure that you use different materials to distinguish between the zones, such as slabs, gravel or loose slate. And remember, you don't have to have a lawn if you find them too much upkeep. Finally, you need to think vertically. If everything in your garden is all at one level, it will always feel uninspiring. Now, you can't magic a tree overnight, but you can consider planting some tall grasses or even a small fruit tree for height. Raised beds also look great, particularly those that are built from railway sleepers, and then they can double up as seating too. You could also add a small pergola in one corner and then train a climbing plant over it for more interest. Or if you don't have room for that and space is even more limited, why not look for a wooden or metal obelisk that you can then grow climbers up? So there you have it, cover those fences, create zones and think vertically to make even the smallest garden somewhere that you'll enjoy spending time. If the weather plays ball, of course. Now, have you ever been locked out of your house without your keys? If so, here's our home tech expert Verity with advice on why a smart lock could be top of your shopping list. Still to come, we take a tour of a really sociable open plan kitchen extension. If you're anything like my husband and can manage to lock yourself out of the house, sometimes with a baby still inside the house, then this week's smart tech section is just for you. <laughs> so Verity, today we're talking about smart locks. What, what are they? What do they do? So um, they attach onto your door and they allow you to go keyless. So it can be that you use an app to let yourself in. It can just be that it recognises your phone as you're approaching the door and unlocks the door. Um, it can be a key code. Uh, there's a there's a various different ways you can use smart locks and again it, it will be dependent on brand you can also give a kind of access to uh, delivery people or even friends and family and you can put a time limit on that if you'd only like your mum to be able to have access to your house you know on a Monday or something <laughs> so um, yes yeah, so it kind of gives you a little bit more flexibility um, and so yeah when you 
don't have to worry about losing your keys. <laughs> and are they secure? Because what if you lose your phone and then someone else can use it to unlock the door? So on the whole, if you lose your phone, you are going to have to get in contact with uh, your smart lock provider, usually through through a, a, a web app or, or through somebody else's smartphone. Let them know you've lost your phone and they can put in security steps um, to make sure that that's not possible. But I guess it is a little bit like if you if you lost your keys, if somebody knew where, uh, where you live, they could access your, your home. So there is a sort of a roadblock in terms of having to get in contact with your provider um, but as long as you you do that with you know in a timely fashion your home should be should be secure and you can lock it down and do they work with all types of door or are there some that they just don't work with different um, locks will work with different doors um, you can usually go onto the website you're looking at and it would they'll usually be kind of like a compatibility check it will depend on the shape of your current lock and things like that um, so yes always check that your you know before you buy that your door and your type of lock uh, that your, your mechanical lock is compatible with the with the smart lock and are they for DIYers like can I install it myself or do I need to get a pro in to install it there, there's both. Um, there's some that are going to be a little bit more involved that you're going to need somebody to install. But on the whole, um, most of them are, are do-it-yourself jobs. If you've, if you can, you know, follow a few, follow a few step-by-step -step instructions, uh, you can usually, you can usually do them yourself. And cost-wise, what what sort of money should we be looking to spend? Well, whereas with other bits of smart home, you might fancy trying, you know, a brand you haven't heard of, or you know, going a little bit budget, see how you do. I think overall the recommendation is that you know you should spend as much as you as you can on on a smart lock um, for the reasons we've discussed previously, um, in terms of it being a reputable company and you knowing that your you know your home is in safe hands. Um, on the whole, the ones that are really out there are kind of £200 and above. That's for one lock, depending on if you just need to get, big, you know, put a smart lock on your front door, if you want it on both doors, if you have a couple of different access points. Um, on the whole, I think most people are probably just going to want it on their front door. So, yeah, £200 and above um, uh, is about the sort of price you want to be wanting to be spending. I think you've sold me on that one. Money well spent if it can stop my husband locking himself out. <laughs> <Definitely. again. laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you so much, Verity. Join us next time. We're going to be talking about smart washing machines. If we're sparking your interest in smart homes, then head to realhomes.com forward slash the hyphen hub for more of Verity's easy to understand advice. In the last episode, we asked you to share your favorite shots of your home with us on Instagram. And here are three of my favorites. First up, if you're looking for inspiration for a fun, colorful kids bedroom, then Rowan's Rainbow is definitely here to provide the inspiration you need. Secondly, for those of you who think more is more, check out this real maximalist bedroom from Lush Eclectic. And finally, Little Terraced House is really appealing to my OCD with her super organised bookshelf against a crisp white background. If you need more proof that white doesn't have to be boring, then it's time to spin our colour wheel. What is black and white and red all over? Not a newspaper, it's stylist, colour expert and beautiful lady Anna Morley and I. Get it? Black, white, red. Anyway. Clever. Anyway, it was clever. It, it was clever. It was clever, but I think if you have yeah. to explain, it's not, not as sure. clever. Not sure. Never mind. So last time, the colour wheel landed on the crack and I decided did. we talk about white today. It did, yes. So describe white for me in three words. Okay, so it's fresh, it's pure, and innocent. Oh, it's like me. Just like you, Laura. <laughs> Just like the you. Clean bit, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Pure. So, white is everywhere in our homes, isn't it? It so, is. Should it be everywhere? Well, this is the interesting thing about white, is we kind of live with it. When you think about, I'm going to decorate with white, I mean, we've got it on our skirting boards, our ceilings, our doors. We kind of live with white, but I think we're kind of talking about when we decorate with white rather than it just being there. So actually being thoughtful about the process of including it in our houses. Okay, so are the, are the rooms of the house it works particularly well in? As we've said, we probably do already have it in every room in the house. Definitely, most probably in your bathroom with a white suite. The rooms I would almost avoid using it in is a dark room or a small room. A basically, a room without very much light because it needs natural light to kind of bounce around it. Otherwise, it can look quite dull and a bit, ugh, a bit washed out. So avoid rooms that are north facing really with your whites. And what colours does it go with, obviously? You're modelling black and white. A bit of monochrome. But what else should we be looking to pair it with? Well, you, really, you can, as you probably know in your house, you can really pair it with anything. But um, like pale greys, it works with, and neutrals because it kind of they kind of offset each other. Pale woods, you know, you, you really want this contrasty look. 
hello, contrast, or you want to kind of kind of blend it in. So you go with neutrals, the creams, with the um, light browns and truffles. So if I want a little bit of white in my home, maybe spend forty pounds. What should I go for? I would say go for some tiles. It's just a classic. You're going to probably like it for a long time. You can work around it. You can maybe paint the walls. So yeah, a tile. I mean, I've got tiles. I've got Metro tiles in my downstairs loo, which I still really like. They've been around for a while. So if I want to spend a little bit more, maybe £150, what should I go for? So we, you might have already got this in your house. I think lots of people probably have, but um, a, picture, a picture shelf mm -hmm. or a bookcase. Um, there's the nice ladder style ones. Yeah, ladder style ones like this. So um, if you do have a, a white shelf against a dark background it really does pop out really make a crisp line then you put your pictures on or you dress it appropriately you have a nice plant trailing down that is a really nice way to introduce white into the home and practical very practical mm -hmm. always good and then finally blow the budget 500 pounds what's the the fail safe that i should be getting in white okay so we've seen a trend of color bathrooms coming back in mm -hmm. it's coming back in we've seen all sorts the avocado suites genuinely are mm. creeping back in. Now, I think for me, I'm not someone who wants to rip out a bathroom very often, so I probably would go for a bathroom suite. If you want to just upgrade what you've got, you can go for something more contemporary. Within that suite, go for a more square style. Black taps, we love a black tap. And a brass tap or gold, I love that. So that would kind of give a little bit more of the trend, but you keep that kind of like classic white bathroom suite, so you don't have to keep upgrading all the, all the big and probably going to help if you sell more than an avocado sweet. I think so, I think so. I mean, we might eat our words, Nora, but... Uh, what do we know? <laughs> what do we, I just think, I remember those, and I, you know, no. It's a no, it's a no for me today. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Proof that it'll be all white on the colour wheel. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Would you like to spin and see where we're going next time? OK. Ooh, minty fresh. Mint chocolate chip. Best ice cream <laughs> flavour ever. Without a doubt. Gun. We agree. We agree on something. If you too like a little bit of mint, then join us next time and we'll be telling you how to bring the colour into your house. Now, if you'd love a kitchen that's just perfect for entertaining, sit back and relax as we take a look around interior designer Dee Campling's open plan kitchen extension. Stick around for advice on dealing with tradespeople. So this area was the original part of the house. This is the original part, yes, and then we extended out sideways from from here. Okay. And it's a bit closer here. So it was tiny, wasn't it? So this it area tiny, yeah. Typically of yeah. older yeah. properties of this style. It was really narrow and it was really dark. Um, it only had one window. It was and it, the whole house, you know, the front of the house was really lovely and open yeah. and high ceilings. And as you came through the house, it got darker and darker. So you fell in love with the front bit first. Yes. Yeah sort of the grandeur of it Absolutely. and then a kind of dark area at the back. Yeah, very dingy and it didn't really work for us. It was very narrow, very dark. Mm. Yeah, we wanted to make it a more functional living space for our growing family um, and we like socialising so we wanted to open the space right up to be much more functional and also give it all the light that it was lacking that the rest of the house had naturally so kind of put the proportions and the light back into the house where we felt it was lacking. And obviously the kitchen had to be functional first of all, yeah. um, so you know it's got everything we need. When we have friends around for dinner, we can be cooking here and washing up or preparing things and people sit around here, yeah. we, call it, we call this the cafe, and sit around there chatting, eating their nibbles, yeah. they can sit in the window and chat, glass of wine, and everyone's talking and talking together. Then once we've got the food ready or we've had our yeah nibbles and everyone goes into the dining area but yeah it's very sociable and it works really well for the kids as well now they're older and um, we have those back doors open and I, I love using the ideas of like cafes and restaurants to influence your home yeah. design as well I think that kind of line between cafes and living spaces is really blurring so I love multifunctional fun spaces it's cost prohibitive to remove the corner of the house completely. So you kind of, you stuck with the pillar. Absolutely, yeah. But actually, it works brilliantly in this space. You f it, the flow around it works really well. You've almost got four zones. And if people do it and they do it deliberately, yeah. it just works really, really well. If you're planning a kitchen extension of your own, then here's our renovation expert, Jason Orm, with his advice on paying tradespeople. Now, Wendy in Norfolk writes in with a question that's common to a lot of us. What do you do when the quote you've had back from a tradesperson is much higher than you'd hoped? 
firstly, and most importantly of all, it's highly likely that their cost isn't the thing that's actually too high. It was that your initial expectation was too low. Now, it goes without saying that no one better knows the cost of building work than builders. So your expectations might be based on a similar job you did years ago or an old concept of what day rates might be nowadays. The key is to approach the quote with the respect it deserves. If you get the sense that it's higher than it should be, of course you should be aiming to get more quotes in to get a sense of where the market is. And that's going to be your best guide to what's sensible in terms of pricing. If, of course, having been through all this and it's still the case that the trade person you want to use is quoting much higher than they should be, then you could ask them for a breakdown of how they came to get the cost in the first place. They might not be too keen on going through this with you, but if they are, you could compare things like day rates and materials prices that way. But just be really careful about trying to negotiate with them. You'll end up with a job where they're lacking enthusiasm and probably won't ever be completed properly. If they're cutting their costs, then they'll cut the work accordingly. So I can only then suggest that you look to take on some work yourself, choose cheaper materials, or ultimately walk away. Now is the moment you've all been waiting for. We've teamed up with Modish Living to give away an Almafi U-Bar Industrial Oak dining table worth a cool £1,250. To be in with a chance of winning, simply head to realhomes.com forward slash TV and answer this simple multiple choice question. What colour did we focus on in the colour wheel section of this episode? Now you've got until midnight on September the 18th to enter, so good luck. Join me next time for five things you didn't know you could do with baking powder, tips on revamping a 1920s home and how to choose artwork on any budget. In the meantime, head to realhomes.com forward slash TV for more on everything I've talked about in the show and don't forget to pick up a copy of Real Homes magazine. Happy homemaking!